exactly. The uh, ark, the box itself represented the female, uh, the female, the ability to give life. Jordan Maxwell is quite matter-of-factly telling us that the real meaning of the Jewish Ark of the Covenant is not what the Jewish people wrote about extensively, but instead what Helena Blavatsky said in her book, The Secret Doctrine. Some scholars suggest that the entire Bible is about what the Ark of the Covenant represents. But all parties do agree that, according to the Hebrews, it did not represent the female ability to give life. This version is only found in Freemasonry. And it is also very suspicious why Maxwell continually tells us that true history is the mystery school history. And so the priest would drop blood in front of the ark, representing the menstrual cycle of the female. This is really funny if you think about it. Jordan Maxwell is secretly using Helena Blavatsky's version of Judaism as his source to discredit Judaism. To say that's a biased source would be an understatement. Madame Blavatsky's writings were said to influence Hitler and therefore the Nazi regime. So to have this anti-Jewish rhetoric being said to be true history is concerning and it should be a red flag to the truth movement in my opinion. Because it had again to do with sex. If you don't believe me, listen to Jordan Maxwell blame all the world's problems on Judaism. So Judaism today is the most eclectic religion on the face of the earth. Virtually nothing of what it teaches is true. <clears throat> Virtually nothing of, what, of, its, um, of its supposedly background is true. And consequently, the world is filled with violence, bloodshed, or disorder. Good people are dying. There are children who are starving. Our world is in trouble. Solomon's temple. We're told about King Solomon's temple. Incidentally, there was no King Solomon. So don't look for King Solomon in history because there was no King Solomon. I didn't take Maxwell's advice on this one, and I did look. And I found the San Francisco Chronicle article from 2003 where this Harvard professor is quoted as saying, we don't need to rely any more on the Bible or Shoshank's inscriptions at Karnak to establish that Solomon and his kingdom really existed, because we now have the superb evidence of the radiocarbon dates. That's the word Sol Om On. S O L is the sun in Latin. In Latin, the word sun is S O L, Sol. And in the Hindu, the Hindu priest of the sun will. They're, they call the sun Om. Actually, the Hindus do not call the sun Om, and the symbol and word Om have no connotation to the sun directly that I can find whatsoever. Remember the priest of Om? They chant Om. And On is the city of the sun. The Greeks call it Heliopolis. It's called Heliopolis to this day. But the Egyptians, Heliosopolis, Heliopolis means the city of the sun. The city of the sun, Heliopolis in Greek, was originally called in the Egyptian On. Look. Keep in mind, he wants us to go to the Egyptian on that last one. I think on the first one, he wants us to go to Latin. The second one is Hindu, but it doesn't really matter because he's lying there anyway. But the important part here is that the Hebrew people never even used the word Solomon. They used the word Shlomo. And the word Solomon comes from the Latin or Greek. So this could only work at a much later date and I'm okay with that being something the mystery schools do because they do seem to want to merge Judaism with sun worship but Maxwell never seems to suggest that. He's always suggesting that it is the true history and that Solomon never existed which is odd because it falls in line with the, what the mystery schools want us to believe and what they believe. Get up in any dictionary, O-N. That's why when you walk into a room, you flip a switch on. Okay, let's just see if you can wrap your head around this stupidity here. What he is suggesting is that the Egyptian word for on, which has connotations to the sun, is why the English came up with the word on before the electric light was even invented people were getting on their horses or um, whatever so to say that the word on was invented anticipating or electric light or to say that when they were trying to decide what to call the 
thing you would do to flip a switch of the new electric light, the masons stepped in and said, We shall call it on. It's just ridiculously stupid. Because on was the city of the sun in Egypt. So the three words for the sun in the three esoteric languages of the world is Sol, Om, and On, Solomon. Let's look at the, the ground plan for Solomon's temple. Here's what it really is. You'll see the male phallic, and it's within the female. So the whole temple of Solomon, the holy, is, is the male phallic, and the most holy is the head of the penis, and it goes into the female, which is called the temple of Solomon, the temple of life. And consequently, Solomon's temple was merely a representation of the sex act. This is a little complicated, but Maxwell is telling you what Blavatsky believes, and he's also telling you what Albert Pike believes, and just about every Mason believes about the temple. They regard it as very, very symbolic and very important. The main problem is, is that the Hebrew people wrote more extensively about it and much more ancient and detailed writings about the temple and their descriptions and reasoning for symbolism is vastly different than the modern writings of Blavatsky and Albert Pike. But this doesn't stop Maxwell from telling you which one is real and which one isn't. It's actually a symbol of Hiram Abiff, who the Masons believe to be a master Mason, and they actually don't really believe it's he was real either. They see him as a symbol of Osiris and the Osiris cycle of death and resurrecting. It is this tradition that is played out in Skull and Bones of the laying in the coffin and being reborn. That's why George Bush can say that he is born again when people ask him if he's a Christian. It all goes back to the ancient mystery schools of Egypt, and the initiates, all initiates, would lay into the sarcophagus of the great pyramid of Giza to be reborn into the mystery school tradition. Oddly, Maxwell has done that. If you've never been in the Great Pyramid of Giza, I will tell you it's an extraordinary experience. I laid in the king's sarcophagus and was blessed in a ritual by a Chemite priest. Here we're told about the manna from heaven. I don't know if you've ever remember Moses was uh, leading the children of Israel to pick manna from heaven. They would find manna from heaven on the ground each morning, the scripture says. Here they are picking up the manna from heaven on the ground each morning. Here in Exodus <clears throat> 16, 14, it says, And when the dew that lay on the ground was gone up, behold, the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing. So they called it manna. Well, what is manna? The manna from heaven was a small round thing. And it says when the dew that was on the ground, of course, when the sun comes up, it evaporates, and behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing. <clears throat> Mana, meaning Hebrew, what is it? And it's seven characteristics from the old ancient world. Small, round, wafer-like, sweet, could be hard, can be melted, and it was obviously from heaven. Because when you ate the mana, you could talk to God. Did you catch that? He moves on from that last characteristic, which was from heaven, and just simply says, because you could talk to God. Because it helps with his shrooms or mana theory, but the text in no way indicates or implies or suggests that manna had any purpose for talking to God or any other spiritual connotation whatsoever. It was strictly used for sustenance. Here, watch it again and watch how he makes the connections to mushrooms. Also take note of the other characteristics he mentions for manna. Thank <clears throat> Mana, meaning Hebrew, what is it? And it's seven characteristics from the old ancient world. Small, round, wafer-like, sweet, could be hard, can be melted, and it was obviously from heaven. Because when you ate the mana, you could talk to God. Well, now we found out mana was a small, round thing, mushrooms. There are many problems in the text itself with trying to make mana psychedelic mushrooms. For instance, neither the psilocybin mushroom nor the Amanita muscaria mushroom will grow in the desert. The text also says that the mana would melt in the desert heat. This is not a characteristic of either one of those types of mushrooms, especially in the desert. In addition, it said that if it was left out, it would begin to stink and then get worms in it. 
Again, this is not the characteristic of either one of those mushrooms when they would simply dry up. It also makes it quite clear that they used manna every day for food. This would not be possible with either one of those mushrooms in nutritional value. In addition, in Exodus chapter 16, 31, it says the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Anybody that's ever eaten psychedelic mushrooms will tell you they taste like a lot of things, but like wafers made with honey is not one of them. <laughs>